This is a production of PBS Charlotte. This weekend off the record raises for Charlotte Mecklenburg teachers. CMS wants them. Teachers say they deserve them, but will county commissioners approve them? Also from county commission, a little short on the rent this month. Well, if you live in affordable housing, maybe the county can help. Also another police shooting here in Charlotte this week. We'll talk about the reaction from the community and from the police department itself. From Raleigh, proposed new rules that would force the sheriff to work with ICE on immigration, whether he wants to or not. And Charlotte's still the home of the Panthers, but maybe not the headquarters of the Panthers in the future. Off the records next on PBS Charlotte. Hi, I'm Jeff Sonier. This is Off the Record, where we talk about the stories you've been talking about this week. And if you watch the news, read the news, or listen to the news, you'll recognize the names and faces around our table. Where's Dedrick? <laughs> Dedrick Russell off this week, but Mark Becker from WSOC-TV here with us. Also, Eli Portillo from the Charlotte Observer and Ashley Fahey from the Charlotte Business Journal. And also, you can join our conversation from home. Just email your questions, comments, and crumpled NCAA brackets to Off the Record. <laughs> at WTVI.org. Well, we usually talk about the Panthers at the end of the show, but because there's so much going on this week regarding where their future headquarters will be or won't be, I thought we'd kind of start there. Um, down in Columbia, there's a lot of activity going on right now that will probably determine whether or not the Panthers headquarters move. So can we talk a little bit about where they are in Columbia today and how what they're doing now may very well affect what uh, David Tepper does next week or next month or whenever? So the legislature there um, in South Carolina is taking up a tax break package totaling almost $120 million mm -hmm. over, uh, I believe, 15 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, it passed the House very quickly. It's run into more questions in the Senate where uh, one senator on Thursday said that he was going to basically um, tag the bill and not allow a vote on it until he sees the economic development analysis from the state that shows supposedly that this is a good deal for South Carolina. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's some back and forth over that for uh, right now, but there still appears to be a widespread support in South Carolina for passing this tax break package to lure the headquarters and the Panthers future practice facility over the border. So we're not talking about moving the stadium, we're not talking about moving mm -hmm. the games, but we are talking about a significant movement by the teams front office and I guess the concern from Charlotte folks is what happens after that? Is that the first shoe to fall? Is, could other development, other moves come afterwards? Um, the governor of South Carolina has already announced this. As, yeah, he's, as if it's a done deal. Yeah, he's very confident about it. He's obviously very supportive of it. He's even talking about maybe bringing rail to Rock Hill with yeah. the result of this. So um, he definitely seems to be completely on board. But, um, you know, I think what people sort of get lost here, and it's a very significant move, yes, but we have to remember the games are staying in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. And it's, of course, you know, we don't know what, what, what will go on long term, but um, it's likely that the David Tepper will go to, of course, local government here and look for, you know, some kind of break with the state stadium um, and things of that nature. So um, I think this is obviously a significant move and we're going to see some ancillary real estate development, but no solid numbers yet, as um, the state senator in South Carolina has said. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that the whole theme of the Panthers years ago, one team, two states, mm -hmm. Carolina Panthers, mm -hmm. Richardson, Jerry Richardson, very deliberate, not calling it the Charlotte Panthers. So on, on some level, the ground was already groundwork was already uh, laid here a long time ago, but it, it's 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 going to be tough for people to you know accept this. Mm -hmm. Now, having said all that, other teams in the NFL have a similar model, and mm -hmm. it's not really where the headquarters are. I don't think that 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 will ch uh, create the identity of the team. I would be astounded if that stadium or any stadium were to be located anywhere but uptown. Mm -hmm. Charlotte uh, mm -hmm. because of the gravity there and I think it's shown in other cities that, that 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 is still probably the best model but if you move those corporate headquarters they're talking about retail they're talking about you know making yeah. it a destination more than just uh, 
more than just a, an office. Right? And, and you're looking at two potential um, pretty significant de uh, real estate developments, because mm -hmm. then you could have the York County or wherever they end up, and then also in Uptown, where their practice fields are today, right. that's ripe land for redevelopment. And yeah. t David Tepper has already said he wants to see that develop with a much higher density, much bigger usages. So, um, I mean, it's, a, it's a definitely a big economic development opportunity, I guess, for both states. Wait, wait, wait. condos Uptown, Charlotte? <laughs> <laughs> what about where have we heard that before? <laughs> well, I asked um, Governor McMaster this week um, if they would consider making a play for the stadium at some point in the future, even right. though that's not on the table right now. And uh, the governor being a, a politic man, he demurred and said, I think this is the start of a beautiful relationship. Mm. So yeah, oh boy. And if who knows what we'll be talking <laughs> about right 10 yeah. to 15 years down yeah. the road. If you've got 200 <laughs> acres, though, and other vacant land adjacent to or nearby, there's that would be, I guess, the, the ultimate fear of anybody in Charlotte that this is just step one towards potentially an ultimate move, just like we've seen you know, in Atlanta where Stadiums have moved from uptown to the the outskirts uh, and back to again. follow development yes. and back and again. Back and again. Let, let, me, let me talk about uh, the the uh, Charlotte Knights. Now it's a hugely different scale, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're mm -hmm. minor league baseball, as fun as it is, it's still minor league right. versus the super major league of the NFL. Mm -hmm. um, and and they moved down to Fort Mill, and you know people just wouldn't go uh, nearly the way maybe they thought they would when George Shin moved the club and built a nice minor league stadium down there, uh, moved it back uptown, instant gravity. Yeah. So I can't see NFL in the near term, maybe down the road, but in the near term, moving because you have the light rail coming into downtown Charlotte and uptown, whatever we call once it. Ago, though, once again, though, you've got the George Shin example where he moved the headquarters of the Hornets down to South Carolina. He moved the practice facility right. down to South Carolina. Ultimately, he moved his baseball stadium down to South Carolina. and. On a larger scale, you could potentially see that the same thing happening. Again, depends on how willing to deal uptown leaders and the state of North Carolina are. But uh, you know, again, it's I guess it's it's that that have we seen this before and might we see it again kind of a thing, I suppose. Hey, other quick question about this: Don't you get the sense that the city, the state? Got their got caught with their pants down here. I mean, while while the South Carolina has this entire package of tax breaks and uh, you know this whole lobbying effort, everybody in Charlotte and in North Carolina seem to be caught off guard and and playing catch up football. Pardon me. Well, I think part of it is you just have an inherent advantage when you're trying to lure someone Good from point. another state. Mm -hmm. South Carolina can get this together. They have a lot of experience making deals with everyone from Boeing to BMW. Good and point putting together attractive packages to lure companies. North Carolina is in a little bit of a harder spot because it's a really tough sell to the legislature uh, in particular to say, let's give this Charlotte company a big tax break package to stay where they are and not expand and not expand their payroll. Right. So I think that's uh, that's kind of a tough sell, especially in Raleigh. Right. I know that uh, the mayor's talked about, I asked her a couple weeks ago about luring new business and, and, and new corporate firms. And she said, we're as interested in keeping what we have. And again, this would seem to be a perfect example of that. But again, with those built-in disadvantages that keeping something has versus luring something you know, might have from the South Carolina point of view. Interesting to see how this all plays out. Again, Tepper's got the deep pockets to make just about anything happen here. So um, we'll see how much. He's got deep pockets because he's made good business decisions and right. he's going to make the best business decision. And, and, and right now, the way it looks at the, you know, to me, an outsider, of South Carolina's got a pretty good offer. Yeah, like I said, mm -hmm. it, it kind of feels like it's happen. a done deal already mm -hmm. in a lot of ways that these votes in Columbia are just the, the formality, you know, being played out. But so. I don't think we got a panic yet that the stadium is moving or that the identity of the team will will significantly yeah. change. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about the police shooting that we saw in Charlotte this week. Uh, happened out on uh, Beatty's Ford Road near I-85 at a fast food restaurant. Yeah. Uh, not unlike other police shootings we've seen in the past, what I think is interesting is is the reaction from not just the community but also the police department, maybe in light of or in the aftermath of what happened a couple of years well, ago. Well, a couple of years ago we saw what I would guess we could call the worst case scenario yeah. where mm -hmm. uh, an African-American man, Keith Lamont Scott, was shot and killed and, and police maybe underestimated the community and civic leaders, underestimated the, 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 the response. Um, they learned from that. And so this time you have an African-American man inside a uh, Burger King and he'd gone in there, we're finding out now to confront someone 
and there was an argument in the Burger King. He had a gun, and they called from the Burger King and said, help, you know, we have a man yeah. in here who's causing a problem. He's got a gun. Police go out there and confront the guy. They say, they tell him, put the, put, the, put the gun down, put the gun down, put the gun down. At some point, one of the officers, only one, fires a shot or two and, and, and kills him. And uh, police were pretty quick that same day to put out the 911 calls from the Burger King saying, we have a guy here who's causing a problem. Um, and at the same time, there were people out there who had another narrative yeah. and police were pretty quick to try and, and, and nip those in the bud with uh, their, 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 their Twitter as well. I think the key word here is pretty quick. I mean, it was amazingly right. quick how uh, <coughs> protests developed across the street, amazingly quick how social media got involved on both ends. I guess we're kind of seeing a new landscape when it comes to these these events and how everybody deals with them, I suppose. Well, CMPD was very quick to actually proactively respond to people on Twitter and tell people, you know, if they thought they were saying something that was not uh, backed up by evidence. Um, they also had people um, like uh, Brian Campagna, who is a CMPD um, officer who rose to some prominence during the Heath Lamont Scott protest for going out and talking to the crowds. Mm -hmm. He showed up there and went out and talked to people immediately. So they were definitely uh, more proactive than we've seen in the past. At the same time, I think incidents like this illustrate that there is um, maybe a double-edged sword to body cams and the way that they're used in, in Charlotte, uh, in North Carolina. Um, since officers are now equipped with body cameras, I think there's an expectation from people that They'll be available really quickly. We'll mm -hmm. see. Mm -hmm. We'll we'll get the the facts. But because CMPD won't release body camera footage without an order from a judge, there's still this dynamic of uh, people believing yeah. that they're holding back they're something. something. Right. They've got the body cam the footage. Distress. Why can't we see it? Mm -hmm. And you know, I think that um, in some ways, having that footage but not having uh, a mechanism to release it really quickly, kind of illustrates this fundamental tension and distrust. Yeah, and I don't know that you can change that because those body cam videos and photographs are all part of an investigation that we hear often from prosecutors right. and from police that take time. You can't investigate these things in a couple of hours or even a couple of days or even a couple of well, weeks. And we go back to the shooting uh, Jonathan Farrell back in 2013 by officer um, Wes Carrick and the dash cam video, remember, release the video, release it. They did not yeah. release it until trial. And so we were there, and that's the way it's always been mm -hmm. in, in the years I've covered this. And you got lawyers saying, well, this is part of the investigation, it's evidence, we can't put it out there. Once it goes to court, then it'll be public record. That's been the old model. The new model is you better get what you can out there and, and show people what happened on those body cameras or dash right. cameras sooner than later because perception no longer waits and, for the trial. And there's also now people obviously shooting video on their own. Right. And what if they only get a segment of it? You right. know, that could be mm -hmm. completely misinterpreted or interpreted in different ways. So mm -hmm. I think you got all these different things going on with social media and, you know, the environment we're living in now that sort of maybe propel that distrust. Yeah, and I think the bad news is that there is distrust on, on every situation like this. Now, I guess the good news is that it doesn't always have to you know, develop into what we saw back in 2016, that people can disagree, people can protest, uh, the police can make their case hopefully more quickly than they have in the past, and everybody can kind of calm down a little bit. And, and so far, in this case, it hasn't, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, act of God, maybe, but it started to pour <laughs> and that, that evening, about 5 o'clock. And mm -hmm. at, I wasn't qualified to say, I wasn't out there, but I know we had crews out there, and at one point they called in and said, we're a little uncomfortable out here. Mm -hmm. but from everything I heard and saw, there was not a huge crowd. There are some of what we call the usual crowd. Uh, Charlotte Uprising had folks out there. Uh, Braxton Winston, city council member who was really made his name in the protest right. in 2016. Um, he was there and, and uh, you know, just to observe and find out what was going on, fact finding, I guess. Mm -hmm. But he, we didn't have that same level of, you know, and Kenton, just in wrapping up, maybe that's the good thing. A person like Braxton Winston, who rose to prominence after the last protest, is now kind of a symbol in the, in the community of that, you know, that kind of resistance. And for right. him to go out there to observe, to not, you know, take it to the next level, but to, you know, do it in a, and, in a, uh, you know, 
a, a upright way is, is right. probably a good thing for everybody to see. And, and just to just to I mean to say it, police have a tough job. They also have a huge responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. They're armed, and 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 they're there to protect people. Mm -hmm. and, and and when you kill somebody, you know there are good legitimate questions that need to be asked. Did that need to happen? Mm -hmm. And and I think, you know, uh, Braxton was there. I haven't spoken with him about it, but pres presumably there to, to, to see no. that, 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 that that's done. There is accountability. There is accountability. Right. There should be. Mm -hmm. And so I think we've come a long way in two and a half years. Yeah. Uh, still issues? Yes. You hope so. so. Um, County Commission uh, involved in a couple of uh, items this week. Uh, one of them is the annual budget uh, fight with uh, CMS. Uh, the school superintendent asking for 70 million more, a 15 percent increase in his current budget, most of which, or half of which at least, would go toward teacher raises. Um, we know how this goes. I mean, we see it year after year after year. The difference this year, I suppose, is we've got an all-democratic county commission with a lot of new members and maybe a taste for raising the taxes necessary to fund these sorts of things. Uh, your thoughts on when you tie the CMS budget request to teacher pay and to equity and to uh, security, do you think county commissioners might be more open to funding those sorts of things? I think that, <clears throat> excuse me, this county commission is, uh, is a lot more vocal about goals like social equity, mm -hmm. um, affordable housing, expanding the budget. They're not, they have not been shy about saying they want to expand the budget, possibly raise taxes. There's been, um, really we've seen the removal of the three Republican members who would kind of put the brakes on mm -hmm. and say, well, no, no, no. There's a lot less of that now. So they have probably more of an appetite to do this than previous commissions, but they also have a lot of requests uh, pending right. right now. They have uh, the Arts um, arts and Science Councils asking for a uh, sales tax um, hike for funding them. Uh, park advocates have been very vocal about asking for more park funding. Mm -hmm. There's a possibility of a uh, land bond uh, mm -hmm. worth hundreds of millions of dollars that the county is studying. That would likely require higher taxes to generate the revenue to pay for it. So uh, in addition to CMS, they're considering a lot of yeah. potentially very costly efforts. Not to mm -hmm. mention affordable housing, which also mm -hmm. was discussed this week, how they can get actively and directly involved in something that traditionally has been more the city's side of the street than the county's. Um, we're talking about the possibility of things like rent subsidies, which is, that's new ground for Charlotte. It is, and that's honestly something that everyone says that's completely not addressed. That's one of the things that's left behind. We talk about new construction all the time, as we should, but there are so many other challenges that um, that renters face, of course, and rent subsidies has been one thing that I know a lot of citizens have come forward uh, in front of council, especially, and said we need we need to do something about this because this is something that um, the local government has so far not mm -hmm. done as much with compared right. to again new construction and more recently rehabbing existing affordable units. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the rental subsidy thing is is a whole other issue and a whole other thing to, to consider. Um, you know, there's a there's a range of things. A lot of landlords don't necessarily take rent subsidies and things of that nature. So I'm sure that would require a good deal of investigation by the county. Um, but the the conversation just shows how prevalent this issue is. And I think commissioners have said, well, why aren't you guys doing anything about this to the commission? Yeah. And reevaluation, I guess, opens the door for them to find that funding. Yeah, year. I mean, we're in a bull market. <laughs> we really are, mm -hmm. right, uh, in Charlotte. We're growing, continue to be, and, and so if not now, when? Now, having said that, <laughs> I mean, I think this commission has to be, and, and I'm sure they will be sort of looking over their shoulders and saying, if, if we want to get reelected, we can't go crazy right. and, and give away the store. But I, I would expect, now the Schools are well, asking wait a second. For Giving away the store is an effective way to get reelected. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on who you're Unless talking you to, own I the suppose. Store. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> you know, 15% for schools? You know, listen, you always ask for X and you, yeah. you know, really hope for half of X. Right. Uh, bottom line, I expect, yes, there will be some, uh, some increase. Everybody thinks teachers are underpaid, and they are, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, for that, you know, that's a soft spot. You're going to go for that. Um, some of the other things around the edges, uh, I don't know, but I, I would I would be surprised if there were not a you know, pretty significant increase for schools and, and affordable housing, the renters, as, mm -hmm. as you've reported here on WTVI, you know, huge issue, right? Um, people, they, they're really the ones yeah. who hurt. Uh, they're the ones who can't afford to buy a home or in many cases. I do think the people who are asking for the money in many cases are learning where the hot buttons are, learning where the soft spots right. are. Right. 
Mm -hmm. You know, when you ask for 15% more in a school budget and you specifically talk about half of it going to teacher pay and another large chunk going to equity, that's, I mean, they can spend that money any way they want, but for them to tie it at this early stage to those kinds of issues, those kinds of potential voting blocks as well, I think that's a, that's a smart move on the part of the superintendent and ultimately a smart move on the part of the arts community and others who come forward saying we'd like to, you know, we'd like to, you know, see our funding get increased as well. But again, it makes you wonder where this tax rate will be at the, at the end of June when they, when they have all these requests on the table and, um, and a lot of these requests come from constituencies that help get them elected. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious what my bill's gonna look like. I think it's, I, I don't know. I'm not a commissioner, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not, uh, not, 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 certainly not a seer, but I would expect there'll be some, some bump up. Yes, I think they've signaled multiple times, you know, George Dunlap, the uh, chairman, even said that he doesn't think there's a big chance of a revenue neutral rate. Mm -hmm. He thinks there's a bigger chance of a uh, rate that would raise more revenue, a higher rate. Right. So mm -hmm. I think that um, one thing that some of the commissioners are going to have to consider is the three who were elected from traditionally Republican districts um, in the <coughs> northern and southern parts of the county who uh, displaced Republican incumbents, mm -hmm. they've got to, as you said, look over their shoulders and wonder, are they going to um, annoy their people, voters who elected them and then turn around and get a tax hike, those districts could go back and say, you know, we're going with the Republican this time because this is not what we wanted. Well, the next time around it'll be a presidential election year too, so there's a lot of other things that'll be in play that probably have nothing to do with the local tax rate. Who but, will be uh, paying attention to that? <laughs> <laughs> Especially since it's not happening here. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I um, uh, wanted to talk a little bit about uh, uh, Raleigh again to, uh, and their proposed rules on how sheriffs and sheriff's departments deal with ICE and immigration. We've seen this year several newly elected sheriffs in some of the most populous counties in North Carolina, including Mecklenburg and Sheriff Gary McFadden, move away from cooperation with ICE, move away from detaining folks with questionable uh, immigration status. Now the, the legislature is sticking their nose into that debate and um, uh, this can't end well, can it? I mean, it's uh, how will it end? I guess it's, is my question. It's again. I mean, I really think at the core of it is the you know the great state of Mecklenburg, as perceived by many of the legislators in Raleigh, uh, you know, sort of trying to do their do their thing and others. But yeah. this mm -hmm. is all about the tug of war between Raleigh and state state leaders and and, and local jurisdictions and. I, I don't know. With the the, the no no longer a supermajority, will, will Republicans yeah. be able to push this through? I don't know. I get the sense this is more of a Democrat Republican thing because this is also happening in Raleigh and Durham. It's happening right under the noses it's of urban these, and so, rural. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. Buncombe yeah. County with yeah. Asheville right. as well. So mm -hmm. so I mean, it, uh, what I sense is that you know we've got uh, we've still got a Republican majority in Raleigh right. that sees immigration as a as an issue. That they 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 like to they like where they are on that. Yeah, I and, think and they see these Democratic sheriffs as you know <clears throat> what they call them sanctuary sheriffs. I love that phrase. <laughs> but I mean, it does kind of it creates an image that uh, I think they like for re-election purposes. And yeah, that sort of thing. I think it's a it's an issue that they think is pretty potent going forward, especially mm -hmm. going forward into 2020. It's mm -hmm. obviously a a huge issue in the national debate with right. the wall and um, you know detentions on the southern border. So bringing it into uh, state and local politics uh, makes sense if you want to stir up your base that way. The bill that's in Raleigh would fine um, and the sheriffs, I believe, $25,000. $25,000 a day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that would be- Who don't cooperate. Yeah. A huge hit, but if you do the math, I think that's about $9 million a year and change. Theoretically, it would be a big hit, but Mecklenburg County, uh, could decide to increase the sheriff's budget nine million dollars to pay that fine. Right. Not saying it would happen, but I'm not sure that even if this bill passes and survives a veto, that it would force every county to change their behavior. Yeah, there's a lot of ways for a lot of different parties to get involved in this debate, and that's that's one of them that uh, you kind of read my mind on that. That you know, ultimately, you know, it's like a chess game, I suppose. You mm -hmm. know, the, the the sheriffs made the first move. Now the legislature is, is coming back with their move. 
the local uh, communities who support their sheriffs, assumably, can make that next move. But it, again, it makes you wonder what the ultimate you know, outcome is here. I mean, meanwhile, we have ICE supposedly making far more arrests in Charlotte and some of these other cities. We hear about fear in the, in the immigrant community about, you know, the presence of ICE, ICE blaming the sheriffs themselves for their, you know, the, the necessity of doing all this. Uh, I guess as long as it, be, is, is it remains a campaign issue for a lot of different politicians on both sides, you know, no resolution is almost a good resolution for those people and, running for office. And, and again, I mean, all politics are national, right? I mean, the, the whole border security, build a wall, don't build a wall issue is really one that has energized uh, the, the, the Trump's base, mm -hmm. President Trump's base. And, and, you know, so I think on the state level, probably you're right. There are the Republican legislature saying, well, this is an issue that, that you know, is positive with our, our, our base and, and we're going to go with it. Now, do they have the majority or supermajority to block a veto if, if Governor Cooper were to veto a bill like this? I don't know. Yeah, it's not. There's no guarantee uh, veto. It's not a veto-proof legislature right. anymore. But they certainly have the votes, um, you know, to to move things in their own direction. And mm -hmm. um, again, a veto is not necessarily a bad thing politically for some of these folks on either side. Again, they use the veto as as another you know fundraising opportunity when it comes to running for re-election and that sort of. Yeah, well, we so. did the right thing, but the governor. Yeah. <laughs> Or, mm -hmm. or, or we managed to stop the governor from, you know, right, from, right. from right. you know, what, what people really want, what our constituents really want. And so, um, again, it, it's so much, so much politics is involved in what ought to be a simple debate about what's the right thing and the wrong thing to do when it comes to illegal immigration and, and, and how law enforcement ought to be involved. But, well, we're out of time. I appreciate uh, everybody being here this morning. Dedrick. Everybody. Yeah, everybody <laughs> Almost Dedrick, everybody being The empty here. chair. You know, let's, let's call him on it. He's on assignment today, but hopefully we'll see him next week again. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. And anytime you want to join our debate, again, remember you can uh, get in touch with us at um, off the record at WTVI.org. Thanks for joining us this time around, and we'll see you next time on Off the Record. Production of PBS Charlotte.